This is the Criterion Creeps Podcast, and tonight we're talking about those Maisel's Brothers documentaries. We got two of them for you, and first up is Salesman from 1968. Uh, the synopsis here from Letterboxd. This documentary from Albert and David Maisel's follows the bitter rivalry of four door-to-door, door, four door-to-door salesmen wow. working for the Mid-American okay. Bible Company, Paul the Badger Brennan, Charles the Gipper McDevitt, James the Rabbit Baker, and Raymond the Bull Mardos. Times are tough for this hard-living quartet who spend their days traveling through small-town America, trying their best to peddle gold-leaf Bibles to an apathetic crowd of lower-middle-class housewives and elderly couples. Uh, first thing I'll kind of point out is it's not really like small-town America. It's pretty well like the Northeast. It's, mm-hmm. it's that whole pocket of Boston, hence all the, the accents. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. There's small towns in it's Boston. Like, it's like Boston, New England, and then yeah. some outside areas. Yeah, they, Florida, there's talk of like Chicago, that. but yeah. you, you don't see them make it out there, I don't think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I've seen that salesman before. Uh, I'm a fan of those documentaries. I'd always mm-hmm. like that Give Me Shelter. So, Salesman was always on the uh, my radar. So, I watched it way back when. I've had this DVD for a while. Uh, this is actually one where I own both these on DVD. Um and yeah, uh, salesman. It's never been like as awesome as I always hoped it would be. Um, I'm a fan of those like Death of a Salesman plays and Glengarry Glen Ross by David Mamet and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I love the idea like uh, Tin Men, the one movie with uh, Richard Dreyfus uh, and Danny DeVito. I like these movies mm-hmm. of just like yeah, s- I don't know, loser salesman. And people like trying to sell other poor bastards on things they don't really need. So salesman uh, is like all those things, but it's never like been this like awesome home run for me. But I enjoy it mm-hmm. quite a bit at the end of the day uh, because mm-hmm. I don't know if there's ever been a depiction of a man is like fucking as sad and desperate as Paul the Badger Brennan. That guy, yeah. every time he's on in frame, oh, he's just always. It's never he never can catch a break. It's always just not his fault. He's always in, like it's mm-hmm. always it's always just disappointment at all times with him. <laughs> um. So anyway, so this documentary, Salesman, uh, it depicts a different era. Um, it's one of the advantages of sort of these like direct cinema, cinema verite types of uh, affairs where it's completely situated in the time and place that it's filmed. So there's not a lot of like Netflixing uh, documentary mm-hmm. style filmmaking where it's like a capsule and it's like people now reflecting about the time they grew up in and like, oh man, when we were in the call, it was amazing. We could do anything. Like you're getting people like wish, like wish, wishful thinking. And then you have all this like footage from that period, which is nice, mm-hmm. but it's also like, compiled like the only time they were filming was when they wanted to show you something positive in terms of like the propaganda uh, or when it's how it served their purposes with something like salesman though it's made in the time you're going to see the way people lived in that moment and Mm -hmm. it isn't always like you know rosy or sunny it's just like oh yeah this is the day-to-day life and it's also in this period of time it's the late 60s uh which is this kind of window where people think of that stuff and it's like it's all about hippies man uh like and but you realize it's like well that was like one aspect of culture in america at the time this is like a, a reflection of like yeah lower middle class catholic life um and men just in motel rooms traveling around trying to scrum together money to make payments and stuff like that uh, sad mm-hmm. phone calls back to their wives, the kids they never get to see. Um, just like sad, yeah, sad is a word that's going to come up here a lot. This could be called mm-hmm. sad man. Um, yeah, just Ooh. people looking longingly at walls or into nothing as they sit around uh, kitchen tables talking to people who like you can like just on film you can see that they're like avoiding eye contact because they do not they, they, they fear confrontation and like looking someone mm-hmm. square in the eye and going i'm not interested get out of my house now please it's just a lot of uh i don't know Ugh. at times it, it, it kind of turns my stomach watching people mm-hmm. getting suckered into buying of all things a bible um which i couldn't think of a more worthless investment in my life 
uh, than something like this. It's no, that's it's a heritage thing. You can build a household on one of these Bibles. Yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, it's made very clear in the movie tell, why. Tell me more, the rabbit. Uh huh. Yeah. It's an investment, Jared. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. Hey, RJ, did this movie make you like want to start smoking while watching it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. There, there's a lot of movies where they smoke a lot. I think the worst one for me ever was a uh, Hollywood Land. Or the Black Dahlia. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. Because th- those came out like the same day or some shit like that. But there's a lot of smoking in that movie. And I remember me and Ham meet one time. We had to leave the theater to go have a dart because we were just like, oof. A lot of smoking in that movie. Oh, boy. Uh, what are we talking about? Salesmen. Yeah, they smoke a lot. They smoke a lot. And it, and it makes you want a smoke. Yeah. One of those sweet, uh, you know, savory <laughs> cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wait till we get to eight and a half. That movie who makes smoking the coolest thing ever. That does uh, make it look cool. This is like, but this movie shows smoking in a way of it's like, you know, smoking can really pick people up. Look how bad this guy's day was. Mm-hmm. This guy's life is shit. But hey, yeah, at least out, he has cigarettes. Yeah, standing out in front of that coffee shop in those, yeah. all those like hotel conference rooms with a bunch mm-hmm. of men. And it's like watching these guys, like, I don't know. To me, the, the salesmen for salesmen are motivational keynote speakers. Yeah. Um, cause they speak the same language that the salesmen are trying to like use on regular folk. And so they're like, well, what are they susceptible to? And they have to like sit in these rooms and listen to guys who like claim that they're very successful salesmen and they're just mm-hmm. going to like feed the same lines and psychology back. And the guys go, yeah, that's going to be me. I'm just going to be like Peter up there. We're, we're going to, we're going to land the big one and, uh, we're going to be able to retire and buy, get that, mm-hmm. uh, addition on the house, get that pool. It's going to work out great. And it's just like, oh Jesus. Oh God, this works. I can't believe it. Um, anyways. Yep. Yeah. So there is just like a whole bunch of elements in this, uh, that work for me really well. Uh, I like the grainy kind of handheld cinematography. Um, mm-hmm. it's just, it looks cool. Um, it's like, it's not, I don't know if you call it, it's not quite high contrast, but it's very stark, uh, look to everything. Um, mm-hmm. I l- like kind of how the, uh, the measles got such access to these situations because it's kind of weird, this idea that these people would kind of come up on these people and like, Oh, Hey, let these people are just filming us. They're filming a documentary. Yeah. And we're, now we're going to try to like go to work on you. And, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's like going to cost some of these people money because now they're yep. in this like, or, or, or make them money because now it adds to the high pressure situation that these are of like, well, you don't want to like not buy this Bible on camera, do you? Mm-hmm. And, but it doesn't work out that way because a lot of these people have no money. They have nothing. Yep. And like every single time it's always like, I can't afford this. And, oh, it's just, it's brutal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah. I've got I've got stuff to say about this. Uh, mm-hmm. I dig this though. Hey RJ, uh, yeah. what, what did you think of this salesman? Uh, I'll I'll hit you with this this one first. Uh, as a documentary, I think it's well done. I uh, it's like you were kind of saying it's like a time capsule. It's like taken right out of there because even uh, like out of what is this like nineteen sixty one or something like that sixty eight. 68 so oh, okay this feels like this was made in the 50s right uh, and because and would, of the, would you say is it be- the film stock no I, I wonder if it's like the areas that they're filming in so it's like the houses yeah. and also like there's a lot of winter scenes yeah. that like but, i feel but like it's also in black and white on like i would i guess like poor quality film maybe, maybe not well, poor but older yeah it, i'd say it's six it's, it's six well it's 16 millimeter film i would yeah. guess um, which gives it like that kind of grainy quality because it would be, it was cheap to shoot something like this that way. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this thing feels way older than it is. It seems like it's from an older time, but fuck actually even th- 69. You, but if it was you probably, had, but it would, I but thought it this been came filmed. out in 1951. Yeah. yeah. When I mean, I was so it was released it. in 69, but it was probably shot like over the course a couple of years like, before a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I think I think it's cool in that sense where you see kind of exactly like how people were and even the way the f- like it's filmed and stuff like that. Like these guys, these they're they're good documentarians. Yeah, uh, I think they build the scenes pretty good. Where this one, it's not as much on display, but uh, they build stuff up good. Where 
you they introduce like a certain part or like an element of some character or something like that and then later it kind of you learn more it's just good storytelling good filmmaking i think i think they're good at that um so i think for in that right salesman is good uh i didn't like this uh because i really hated these fucking guys um like so the documentary is good but i had a issue with the content itself with these people because i thought these were like and i i guess that's kind of the point is or, or is it like do you think their goal was to show that these salesmen were just like lousy fucking people like humans because that's how that's how it came off to me was they're like they're super invasive they're smarmy and like they they prey on meek poor people with like catholic guilt they're like mm-hmm. oh well we got your name from the church like you you got to help us out and it's like the people are like we can't afford it they're like we don't have enough money as it is and the guy's like it's a buck a week what's a buck a week oh yeah it's it's a dollar a week and then oh, the guy yeah. gets so pissed off later to when so- he's like i don't understand it he's like people can't pay a dollar a week yeah what is this what is this? And then they, and like, and they also, then they also have to act as their own like collections agency, where they have to like pick up, yeah. the, where they have to get the money, and they're just like all all the lines like, well, oh, I'm only in town until like five o'clock. You gotta, I gotta get that money, otherwise you have to pay me. Well, this I'm money. the manager. I, I, you know, it's not my decision. It's not my decision. I, I've got to get that money. It's just like it's salesman shit. Oh man, and I, like I said, I love yeah. that stuff. Uh, watching it in in real time, watching it like this isn't like a play. This isn't a fiction. This is like yeah. a thing. It's like oh god (laughs) i think yeah i think this watching this like it made me really uncomfortable because one i thought they were bad salesmen and all they did they were just really pushy which i guess is what probably a lot of salesmen actually are like i've never had door-to-door salesmen come to my house that i can remember maybe when i was a kid can't remember as an adult because they don't exist anymore well maybe that's not true but um it made me uncomfortable because I thought they were kind of bad salesmen. Like they had these certain lines that they like kept kind of hitting out. And I know that's what sales is too. But I also felt really bad for the people they were talking to. Kind of like what you were saying also. Uh, these people are on camera. I feel like they would feel more obligated to even, not even just say outright say no. Because you can tell a lot of them they just want to do that. Even though they're like, well, I don't have any money. But the guy's like, that's not an issue. You can pay us whatever you want. Yeah. Give us a dollar this week, a dollar next week. And it's like, I don't, I can't afford a dollar this week. It's like, well, no problem. Give us a dollar this mm-hmm. week and then another dollar next week. And so, but, so I feel like them being on camera, they're saying no, but I feel like they're also maybe not as, uh, free to kind of like what you were saying to just outright be like, get the fuck out of here. Like mm-hmm. get out of my house. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's a good, sh- like a good documentary, a good little piece of history about this weird business of say, like door to door sales and these weird pushy guys. Uh, but I hated these guys. I thought I thought it was total horseshit what they were doing, just because <laughs> it's like these guys suck. They're they're horrible people. And it's like, yeah, I know they're just out there they're, trying to make. A they're buck they're, they're too. just trying to make a buck. Trying to make a buck too. But uh, I also just really didn't like some of the other aspects. So a few things about the movie itself. They, you get introduced to all these characters like the Gippa, the rabbit, the bulldog or whatever. But you only really see one of these guys like you're with him 80 percent of the time, I would say. Yeah. With uh, the guy who's like the pushiest with the super huge fucking long fingers. So you're, you're just with that guy most of the time. And he's like he's the pushiest and he gets mad at people when they don't buy Bibles. So by the <laughs> end of it, you're just like, man, this guy really sucks. Uh, and then. uh Shit, what else was I going to say? Something about the movie itself. Oh, uh, man. I can't remember. I can't remember, Jared. But anyways, they like, oh, so you, they say you're following these four people, but you, you only really follow one. And then uh, I found uh, some of this stuff to, was really repetitive. And not just like them going on door to door being like, hey, you want to buy a Bible? No, okay. But uh, there was like there's certain things that pe- like them as people did. There was the guy who told that story about his like Irish uh, 
Uh, it's like, oh, yeah, he's in the force. He's going to get a good pension. You hear that story like six times. Yeah. And I know that's because that guy tells that story to yeah. anyone who's willing to hear it. Yeah. And I know people like that, too, that I've heard the same story like a hundred times before. But watching it in a documentary where you hear the same story over and over again, I was just like, holy fuck. It's like, I don't want to see this anymore. <laughs> Should- like, I guess, like, it's like I was saying, I think they show it as a point to be like, this yeah. is what this guy was like. He repeats the same story over right. and over again. But I thought they did it a little too much. And then, like I was saying, too, I don't know what the goal of this was, whether it was just like, oh, we're just going to film these guys because it's like this weird thing. Or if if they were intentionally showing that what these guys were, because they came off very bad to me. And I don't know if that's other people or if that's like what was intended for this thing but i don't know man i thought these guys fucking sucked (laughs) Uh, a note about distribution here uh, on wikipedia when salesman was completed there were challenges in showing the film as the mazel's brothers tried to get distribution they were told that the content was too depressing and realistic for the public uh they wound up self-distributing through their production company uh, and they booked theaters for screenings um, yeah, so maybe uh, maybe they're they're right because was this too real for you, RJ? Could you not handle it? No, I like it's not that it was too real. <laughs> I just thought these guys were really shitty people. Yeah, that's maybe it's, you know there are shitty people. Oh yeah, I know. Well, that's I guess yeah, maybe it was too real because I know far too many of these people in real life, mm-hmm. and it's like when I come home, the last thing I want to do is watch more of these people on my TV being shitty and abusive and. Badgering. Well, wouldn't you say then that this film is a success in depicting this? No, no, that's yeah. well, that's why I led with what I was saying. Like, I think this is a good documentary and it shows this really well. I just really hated these people as human. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Humans. Yeah. So th- that's all. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad documentary thing like that. I think it's pretty well done. It's just these guys really suck, man. Like, there's that one scene where he just walks into some guy's house. He just walks in. He's like, oh, are you Mr. Hudson? And they're like, no. He's like, oh, I got your name from the church. He's like, not us. And it's like, well, why would they give us your name then? Because like, I don't know. It's not us. Like, get oh, out of here. I love the one where it's like they, uh, they're they going to the woman. And they're like, oh, you, 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 you dropped this off. You said you were interested. And they're like, no, I'm not. We ch- that was like years ago. And we changed our mind. Well, why, 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 why would you even put your name in? I don't understand that. And it's just like. That is the mentality of like desperate men, though, because it's like mm-hmm. if every Bible you sell, it's like, oh man, if you don't make the cut, you're going to get fired, and if you don't make yep. if you don't make enough money, you're not going to be eating or be able to live yep. the life of living out of motels and sending a meager amount of money back home. And then mm-hmm. and then there's like delusional men talking about how much money they're going to earn that year, and they're oh, just like, and yeah. and so yeah, it's like what you're going to you think you're going to make fifty thousand dollars this year selling Bibles? It's like that's like. I think I looked it up with inflation. That's like over three hundred thousand dollars U.S. Yeah, that the uh, selling like Bibles, the, motiv- the motivational speaking, where they're getting sold the pitch of the their job by like a bet a higher up salesman. I thought was really shitty too. Uh, a direct quote was, uh, "There, the money is out there. Go get it." Uh, and it, like that's all those are is guys being like, "Well, if you don't earn, that's your fault because uh, earning money in this business is." strictly on how you operate as a salesman well, so they they really hammer these like i get why they're like that like they just get told this every time they every opportunity by their superior it's like if you want money go get it yeah go get it and if you don't if you you're don't, a loser always yeah, you're a loser always you be closing <laughs> always be closing yeah exactly yeah see i like the glengarry glenn ross uh salesman world where uh, i can watch alec baldwin talking about nuts and uh and you know jack Lemmon is sad balls and, old. and kevin spacey but, yeah but and al pacino in, in, a, in a chinese restaurant yeah yeah, yeah i like all well, that because stuff. they're super because they're, they're but, yeah sad. because in real life it's too real it's not a stylized uh all-star uh cast but, speaking of too real did you see that scene where it's it's what you were talking about where the guy was like uh the lady's like, I'm not interested. He's like, well, I was just here to wonder why you put your name in then. Yeah. And then he gets mad and leaves. And he's like, oh, I followed this lady seven times yeah. to seven different places. Uh, when he goes to talk to that lady, there's a baby in a high chair out on the front yeah. porch. There is no one watching that Mm-mm. baby because that lady was inside. Because that was real. Who was watching that baby? Except, RJ, that was what it was like in our parents' era. 
That's like uh, that, that. That is that is how our parents grew up. That is the world. That's how it looked. And babies, they're like sometimes left outside because you're like, I'm tired of this baby. If so, mm-hmm. someone, someone takes this baby, uh, heaven forbid. But at the same time, eh, leave it. I don't need it. But, eh, what good are you, your baby? <laughs> yeah, I always have uh, another one. Yeah, exactly. So that's real. Um, this isn't like. Like they're good parents, but this, I always this, joke. This, this isn't a bunch of assholes all on Facebook talking about their fur babies. Like this, this is uh, uh-huh. this, this is this is uh, America, real America. You you know, like I think my cats are my children too, but I have no, I don't say this fur baby shit. I just call it like it is. They're my human children, Hazel and Winnie. Yeah, cats in cat suits. In cat suits, human human children. Mm-hmm. But no, it's like uh, I always bug my um my sister in law. Uh, they got three little kids, and I'm always like, "Who's watching your kids?" And she's like, "The big one's watching the little one." Yeah. I was like, "Oh yeah, smart. Yeah, that is how it goes." That's why you have kids. Yeah, so that the big ones can watch the little ones, and then eventually watch you when you're pooping in your pants. Oh yeah, that, yeah. Uh, have you ever been uh, rooked into buying some stupid shit before, knowingly? Have you ever? Have you ever? Uh, been... If you did a tour of my house uh, for products that you have sold me from your comic store, uh, I believe we talked about this in the preamble. There's a, a lot of stuff in my house here that I uh, immediately had buyer's remorse after buying. Uh, a lot of regret and deep shame. No, yeah. from some of these things. Well, I feel I feel pretty good about myself. Yeah, but you yeah, but you buy more than like eighty percent of the population. You just enjoy buying it. That's right. So if you have no buyer's remorse, then you'll never feel bad about it. That's right. Get over it, folks. Just accept mm-hmm. it. Take it. Give them the all, all they all they want is your money, and it's only Give money. Me. You just always guess what the money's out there. Just go get some more of it and buy so more and buy it. more shit that you don't need. But uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think I don't know. I don't want to admit to it, but I don't. I don't think I've ever been like taken for a ride. I, I find that I'm pretty immune to like the sales pitch. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I find that maybe a lot of people are just not very good at it. The they're just not uh, uh, skillful enough at it. Because it takes a certain personality to I think get, work yourself up to a point where you're like talking people into buying things that they don't need. Um, which actually reminds me of uh, a childhood experience I had with oh god uh, an encyclopedia salesman. So I remember like way back when, like probably it was like five or six, but I remember at my parents' old place, uh, a, a, guy, a young guy, probably like in his like 20s, came to our house and he was invited mm-hmm. in because he had for us encyclopedias to sell us. And man, I remember as a kid thinking these things were amazing. You had mm-hmm. all, of, all of human history, all art, knowledge, mm-hmm. all at your fingertips. And I remember being like, and this, the way the guy, because, and I was watching this salesman and I was watching how he directs all of his like shtick to like people around the person they has to actually pay for it. And like mm-hmm. talking to the kid, I can see your kid's real smart. I can see that they'd really get a lot out of this. I, I think you'd be at a, a great disadvantage if you didn't buy, take this opportunity right now to buy this and bring it into your home. And you can always have this. It'll never devalue. You will always have it around with you and you'll always be mm-hmm. like, man, am I glad I purchased this? And so you know, for a low, low price, only $20 a month. You have all this for you, and I remember being a kid, being like, "This is awesome! I want, I want encyclopedias because encyclopedia sounds so smart. What a smart sounding word! It makes you, mm-hmm. and you can be always like, I have my own set of encyclopedias. <laughs> I don't need a library. Um, mm-hmm. But now it's like, you know, whenever I go to, uh, you know, a value village, one of those secondhand stores, what do you always see in their book area? Piles, Twilight, and piles of Twilight. Paul Reiser's Parenthood and mm-hmm. discarded encyclopedias. Well, uh, the internet's a wonderful thing, Jared. Uh, yeah, I think pretty much the concept of encyclopedias and having hard copies kind of went away uh, yeah. with the advent of, like, you know, the internet and, like, the fact that, like, oh, we have that. We can look that up right now. Um, maybe if the, when the power goes yeah. out, we'll be like, boy, I really wish I had those encyclopedias. But, uh, yeah, but I remember that experience of like my, like my mom having to be like, oh my God, I have to get this guy out of my house. I have to like get him out so I can say, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Cause my kids are like, you should get it, mom. You should get it, mom. You should get it, mom. I don't mm-hmm. understand money. We have no money. We should get this mom. And it's like, Jesus, what a son of a bitch. Yeah. 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 See, preying on the, the meek, uh, the, the dumb, the ignorant the Catholic ch- guilt. Ch- children are 
ignorant. Or, yeah, they have yeah. that Catholic guilt. It's like, well, we already got a Bible. We don't need another Bible. It's like, well, I, mean, I understand that. But, I mean, this is this is like your own legacy. This is this is how mm-hmm. you build a house. This is like the investment in uh, a family, in, in a lifestyle. It's like, mm-hmm. Uh, there's the other one great yeah. bit here, too, is uh, – and he's like the, the 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 old badger. He is just going after this poor woman, and mm-hmm. uh, it's just like him going about like her. Cause her last name's like McConnell, and he starts talking about oh, the, the Irish families and like all oh, Irish people they're like this. And then she's like, "Oh, I'm Polish." He's like, "Oh, that's great. Yeah, you know what's so great about being Polish?" And he starts like he doesn't miss a beat because he made mm-hmm. he he, uh, he called the shot before he knew what it was, and it's like, "Oh, now he's walking fast. He's walking fast. He's losing her. He's losing it." And he's like, <laughs> "It's like fuck, watching that dance." And you're just like, "This is what this documentary is. A lot of watching this like." Ugh this dance and you're just like, man, I, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> so I think it's a, a nice little piece of documentary filmmaking, but uh, I don't know. It's not the most pleasant experience at times. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. The other thing is that uh, those guys suck. <laughs> They're just, Hey, it, you or I could be in that, those shoes one day. One day. Do well, you own a Bible? Uh, You know what, RJ? I yeah. don't. You heathen? Do you have are, any? Do you have any for what, sale? Is this where are, you, they, are they illustrated? Is, is this where you want to be when Jesus comes back? To quote Joe Dirt. <laughs> uh, I do have a Bible. It's a large print Bible. Uh, every page has like five words. That's how big they are. Wow. It's like this big. People listening can't see, but it's like that big. Does it have sweet graphics? I don't know. I think so. I've never really looked through it. Cool. All right. So that's Salesman. <laughs> nice. Uh, next up, Grey Gardens. Mm-hmm. This is from 1976. And here's the tagline for Grey Gardens. Mm-hmm. She was the girl who had everything. Money, good looks, and social position. Her mother, a classic Bouvier beauty. Now they are living amongst the souvenirs of their lives. And the synopsis... This film explores the daily lives of two aging, eccentric relatives of Jackie Kennedy Onassis. Uh, Edie Bouvier Beale and her mother, Edith, are the sole inhabitants of a Long Island estate. During the course of the documentary, they discuss their habits, desires, Mm -hmm. and former loves with filmmakers Albert and David Maisels. The women reveal themselves to be misfits with outsized, engaging personalities. Much of the conversation is centered on their past, as mother and daughter now rarely leave home. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I have seen bits and pieces of Grey Gardens over the years. Um, I remember some years ago, uh, friends of ours had rented this from uh, a video store. And they were like, oh, Chanel, you have to watch Grey Gardens. Because uh, this is like a total Chanel type of uh, f- feeling movie. Chanel pick? Chanel pick. This is a Chanel pick right here. Um, yeah. But, you know, as I'll get to, this is like... Chanel would always admit that, you know, I feel like I should like this way more than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, and I was always kind of like, I don't know how interested I am. And I don't know. I don't know if that's because uh, of my toxic masculinity, uh, where <laughs> I'm just kind of like, I don't know how interested I'm going to be in this gray gardens. Something mm-hmm. about it just isn't for me. Um, so yeah, uh, I dived into this uh, saying, well, maybe it's going to win me over. I don't know. Sometimes uh-huh. th- that happens. This is another slice of the American Northeast. All those, uh, those, those accents, Boston accents, Baston, Baston, all over this place. Baston, uh, such a lovely uh, accent. Thanks. It just tells you exactly everything you need to know about a person, mm. uh, where they're from. Uh, the first thing that I did watching this on DVD: subtitles on. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have to. I gotta say, uh, I watched this with Andy. And uh, within about five minutes, too, she's like, you got to put the subtitles on, man. I can't understand this. So we threw it on. Uh, I watched this on Canopy. And uh, it's been a long time since this has been an issue. But uh, one of the constant complaints I've had about Criterion subtitles is that it's white on white all the time. Like white text on if it's a black and white movie on white screen. And you can never read it. Uh, So on Canopy, uh, the subtitles had... Uh, yeah, so it was a uh, there was a black brick with the white text on it, and I was like, yeah, yeah. I can read, finally. So yeah, okay. So I I don't I don't like that style. They kind of bug me because yeah. you can't see the image underneath them. 
Yeah. Uh, but it, it does kind of – it's a – Trade off for the fact that you can actually read them. Yeah, uh, the, exactly. the issue you're mentioning, the white on white, that comes about because of especially with with the movies that we've watched up to this point, they're older DVDs, and I there's know. like yeah. it, problems where they don't have like uh, a proper drop shadow to like kind <laughs> of help accentuate the text, which I think is no longer a problem. But uh, yeah, no, this is like the first film I think in a while that we've watched where I was like. Uh, the, the audio recording, because again, so Maisel's, they're working like low budget. They're shooting their own stuff. They're lighting their own stuff. It's very low key. Uh, their, their audio mastering and recording is, you know, leaves something to be desired. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, with this, we are introduced to, uh, these ladies, this mother daughter combo. Um, mm-hmm. and we get to hang out with their, them and their cats. In this mm-hmm. dilapidated property, and uh, raccoons, r- raccoons, uh, yeah, they, rakins, they, yeah, they're 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 abundant. Uh, Wonder bread, uh, mm-hmm. feeding those uh, raccoons. Uh, there are just mm-hmm. like spookily creep kind of coming and going through the house. That like one mm-hmm. shot near the end of the movie is so good. Uh, mm-hmm. Just raccoons looking at the camera, people and being like, "Oh, does this guy want that food I'm looking after? Nah, fuck him." And then they just come in. And you're like, "Oh." Shit. Uh, and mm-hmm. cats, cats everywhere. So many cats. I kept thinking, what is RJ going to think about the state of this place and the, the mm-hmm. that, that, uh, bowl that the cats are eating out of? <laughs> I was a little worried that the, the, ra- the rakins and the cats would probably get into fights. Uh, cause we have cats at the barn and, uh, like we take care of them, but uh, there are raccoons in the area. And sometimes, uh, you'll come in the morning and there, there will have been a fight, skirmish over some of that cat yeah. food. Rakins like cat food. So I was a little worried about that. I was like, Ooh, I hope they're not fighting. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so, where I was. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, one of the things that like, um, for a, it's been a while, I feel since we've had a Simpsons reference on this, but when mm-hmm. I, I totally forgot the whole thing about like the Bouvier name and I was like, yeah. Oh yeah. The Simpsons. That's where that came from. Um, so mm-hmm. there's something. I thought that too. Yeah. That was just like, Oh yeah. Cause it's like, I think probably the most famous Bouvier uh, use in the last 30, 40 years is The Simpsons. Marge. Yeah. Yep. Marge Bouvier. Um, so anyway, uh, we're introduced to Edie. Uh, she is a eccentric, crazy, or kind of racist, insecure, vain mm-hmm. woman um, who's like very clearly trying to, I don't know, uh, catch the attention of the filmmakers in like mm. this weird way, but then she doesn't want anything to do with them or be looked at this particular way. But yeah. How do you even start talking about these two? Uh, who big, Edie, uh, big e- Edie or e- little e- Edie? Edie and Edith. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's tough. Edie, my, my big note here, cats. Cause there's lots of cat footage. Do you like, want me to take it? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my feeling on this is, do you like watching crazy old women laying around in a two bedroom room arguing in Boston accents about things that weren't even important 43 years ago. Mm-hmm. Do I have the movie for you? Uh, I think that's a good description. Yeah. You could have added arguing uh, about that stuff while also boiling corn on a hot plate in their bed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's an important thing to notice um, or to make mention of. So I watched this with Andy Jared. Yeah. Uh, and I read I read the description of these two movies, and I was like, I think she would maybe like this Grey Gardens. I, I think she kind of likes those kooky ladies. Yeah, I think that's a good call. Uh, and we watched it together, and I think that uh, thir- uh, increased our enjoyment by a lot because we mm. could bounce stuff off of each other. Uh, I thought this uh, documentary was awesome. I really enjoyed watching these greasy old ladies uh, cooking corn in their bed feeding raccoons and uh just living in squalor and filth um so it's like i think maybe it was because we could like whenever there was something crazy on screen we could look at each other and talk about it and i think that was a big plus because you you know you have a little little direct thing uh i thought this movie was really good uh for a few reasons uh i think their story is crazy uh what happened to them how they were these like uh debutantes and like socialites uh, and then basically through a series of bad men, uh, the big uh, Edith and little Edie were both uh, burned by their fathers, uh, their lovers, um, their boyfriends, uh, sons and brothers um, to a point where they were just like, you know what? Fuck this. 
we're both going to live in this old house. Uh, we're not even going to have power for some of it. We're going to have garbage in here just so we don't have to go out in the world anymore. And it's a little more complex than that because there's the issue of uh, like they're both cl- very clearly not mentally stable. Um, they, like, have, they have some personality disorders. They they have something going on, both of them. Uh, I think at first you really think that uh, it's the daughter who has something going on mm-hmm. because uh, Edith, uh, the mom, uh, she'll like – uh, the daughter will say something like, oh, I was doing this. And Edith will be like, nobody cares. <laughs> and she'll like make a joke uh, or she'll like kind of she'll say something that's like kind of supportive. But then uh, she'll look at the camera and like smirk a little bit. So you're like, holy shit, this old lady's like she's kind of in on it. Like she's su- not supporting, but uh, she knows that like the daughter's a little bit n- not completely sound. But then later in the documentary, you're like, oh, wait. Big Edith is uh, kind of a nut bar too, and nut nut bar is not the right word, but she's a little bit manipulative, and uh, to the point where it's like, oh shit, did she like, did she kind of convince her daughter to stay there? They have a very uh, Sid and Nancy relationship, Jared, <laughs> where they're they both say the exact same things to each other. They're like, uh, I could have had it all if it wasn't for you, but now I'm here, and then the other one will be like, Well, go then. No one's keeping you here. Uh, and they they both use that argument against each other. It's like, well, I it could have been could have been great, but I had to come watch you. And then the mom will be like, well, go then. And then the mom will be like, well, I could have done a bunch of good stuff too, but here I am with you now. So I think they feed off of each other a lot, as you would when you live with your mother in a single room of a mansion for like forty years. Yeah, you, you would develop some inter- complex relationships, I believe. Uh, but so what I really liked about this is. Um, it's not like salesmen where I was like, ah, oh, man, I hate these people. I could, and it's not like that I related to this 80 year old woman who was just naked boiling corn in her bed. I do a little bit. I do stuff like that. Uh, but I think it was mostly like the conversations they had with each other. Like sometimes they're just talking about like pants. They're like, oh yeah, that's a good pair of pants. It's like, yeah, it's good for this kind of thing. It's good for that kind of thing. And then you're just like, you're, <laughs> it's just like you were saying, it's just, pointless conversation but it's in this movie that i'm like you know what i'm actually interested in this i want to know what they have to say about these pants like what's going on here and they're they're just their day-to-day life i think is really interesting like uh she'll go up to the attic and drop an entire loaf of uh, a wonder bread just on the floor Mm -hmm. and uh for the raccoons she'll come feed some cats They'll yell at each other for a while and then they'll go off and then they'll play some music and they'll eat in their bed together. And they make the grossest shit sometimes. Like there's a she's spreading something on crackers at one point in this and it looks like uh it looks like Crisco. I don't I I I could never figure out what it was, but I think it was Crisco or something. Or like when they're boiling corn and that guy who like wants to live there comes in and uh, he eats the corn. He's like, oh, man, this is really good corn, Edith. Oh, and she's like, yeah, it. you always loved my corn. And he, like he's watching her make it in his, her bed. And you're just like, what? Like, who are these people that <laughs> live this that live this life together? You know? Yeah. Like, so There's that. Yeah. The hunk guy that's like hanging out. Yeah. He's like, what's what's his angle? What's what's he uh, what's what's he? Well, it seemed at? like so. uh Edie mentions a lot of times how the mother has let in, or, or has let several men stay there over the course of the last 30 years. There's like three, three guys. There was the uh, Tom Logan. Uh, like she names them all all the mm-hmm. time. So you get a, the name stuck. There's like Tom Logan and like Paul Skorzynski or something like that. And it was something about like how they lived there for a couple years when they were down and out. Uh, but then they would leave. And so the daughter was kind of like, She's like, well, it's just more men that have left. And then the mom, she's kind of more whatever about it. She's like, oh, well, they just needed a place to stay. It wasn't bothering us at all. So I that so to answer your question, the kid, I think he was the handyman mm-hmm. or something like that. But at the same time, he was like, oh, this is a pretty good gig. Mm-hmm. These old ladies just kind of hang out in their room all the time eating, uh, eating weird food. I like that. So I don't know. I think. There is a lot of a lot of stuff to like in this. Uh, some, as we talk about all the time, I'm not always totally on board with uh, really greasy, dirty stuff all the time. Uh, but I was with with Nail and I, and I am with this. I think in the same kind of like trailer park boy sense, where I think 
at the at their heart, they're still kind of good people. Where in the Sid and Nancy respect, they weren't. They didn't seem like it, at least not to me. But uh, Edith and Edie, like they're definitely delusional and like might have some sort of like Edie might be schizophrenic in some way because like she's talking about stuff. She's like, oh, I found this book in the attic. Who was up there? And then and then she's telling the story and she's like, you know what? Maybe I saw a guy with this book. And you're just like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? It's like, did she just make that story up now? What's going yeah, on? that's like so, th- so like, yeah, they're like not totally mentally right. there, but I, just, I can still root for them. Yeah, that's the thing that like I feel like really kind of off about with talking about this movie is yeah. like we throw out all oh, they're crazy. Right. And like that's like yeah. the vast majority of people are going to say that. And I'm kind of like, oh, man, and that's like so shitty because like people who actually study this stuff or know about yeah. this, they would be able to talk about this in a probably far more articulate way and like more compassionate way. And so with this documentary, they never really delve into that because I feel like. Yeah, 1975, I guess, when this came out. Mm-hmm. Um, like, people didn't care about those differences. You were just like, yeah. yeah, everyone's got a crazy uncle. Everyone's got someone that's been touched or whatever, whatever. People are just mm-hmm. fucking weird. And so, like, nowadays, it's like watching this same sort of thing. You're kind of like, yeah, you're just like hanging out with these people that, like, probably, I mean, they're okay only because they're wealthy. And they like, oh, yeah, they, yeah. So, if they didn't have wealth, they would be living on a street and they yeah. wouldn't have lasted as long as they did. And so, right? they have the, it's, so it's sort of a, it's a unique experience. I mean, Grey Gardens is kind of like a legendary documentary that's like kind of a transcended, like, uh, as far as like Maisel's like documentaries. This one, like, there's tons of like spins on this stuff, like that. And people talk about Grey mm-hmm. Gardens. This is like a kind of a touchstone of, um, of documentary filmmaking, this idea, because these characters are so wacky and eccentric and, like, one of a kind. Mm -hmm. But I guess at the same time, I'm kind of like, I don't know if it's, like, the most interesting documentary. Um, I know that, like, I I was definitely, like, ready for this thing to, like, wrap up, like, after Mm -hmm. about an hour and a bit, and I was kind of like, oh, my God, like, I'm just done with this. Like, it's not not doing anything new. It's just, like, more scenes of them arguing and bickering, and I'm Mm -hmm. just like... I am done. I'm beyond yep. this. And it's like, I got, I got it all. There's like no arc to anything, which is like, no. I guess like that's an artificial thing to have in a documentary. And nowadays, mm-hmm. like, but in, cause you're, it's like, you have to have like a beginning, middle and end. This is just like lo- their life and their life and their life and their life. But it's just is like, to me, it's just like, I don't know, this should be more up my alley than it is, but there's just something I don't find particularly interesting about either of them. Like, yep. so it doesn't work as well yeah. for me as others. Um, like, whereas like, I feel like with salesmen, I feel like it says something about, uh, America that I want, like, I feel mm-hmm. is a uh, accurate thing about just like kind of how awful and empty and dreadful and dreary America is. This is kind of like, it's just like, oh yeah, look at these people. And mm-hmm. I don't know, there, there's like the one documentary, uh, The Weird and Wonderful Whites of West Virginia, which mm-hmm. uh, I find is just like, it's entertaining, but it also is like a far more dynamic story because it is about like white trash. Uh, people nice. who like, I don't know, if, are you familiar at all with that documentary? Nope, not at uh, all. So there's this, what's his name, Dancing Dan or whatever. So he's just like figure who like did these like fucking videos of him just dancing. And he's like this incredible like, like lines or not line dancer but two stepper does the tap dance and he's just like he can do this forever and he does it really really amazingly well but like he comes from this whole family of just like people who've been in and out of jail their whole lives it's like real uh as you as you put it like trailer park boys um yep and but it's just like and there's like sort of drama there because there's actual like consequences to the things they're doing and the way that they live in like Mm -hmm. actual poverty uh with gray gardens it's kind of just like oh isn't this nice isn't this nice mental illness and like Mm -hmm. there's no repercussions to anything nothing's going to come about it both people are dead now i mean um big big ed she died like two years after this was released and I think it was even less than that well it, it was like 77 so yeah. so this came out i guess 75 76 yeah. uh and then um uh Edie, she died in 2002 um mm-hmm. and then of course so there's also there's a expanded documentary that 
that mm -hmm. is later on in the Criterion Collection when all these things got re-released. Uh, we'll talk about it again at that point. Uh, is that an official creep? Yeah, like it, 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 it is a spined number, The Beals of Grey Gardens. Mm. Uh, so that's its own documentary in itself uh, with, yeah. with a bunch of other footage. So we get more expanding on this story that mm -hmm. I don't find super engaging personally. But mm. uh, anyway, yeah. And then there's also a yes, movie. There is also, which I, I had lined up to watch, but then you watched it and then I went... Never mind. <laughs> did you see my uh, review of this movie? I, I did, and I thought, and I okay. thought after reading it, I went, "Man, what's the point of even recording a podcast now? It's all in letterboxed." Yeah, I wrote a pretty lengthy review. So the reason I did that too is, like I was saying, uh, we actually uh, enjoyed Grey Gardens. Yeah, uh, I thought it was pretty. I thought it was. Uh, I liked it more than I thought I would, and I'm not like surprised that you didn't like it. I thought you would have liked it. I thought this was a Jarrett pick, yeah. but I do understand what you mean where it is kind of a touchy thing where when you watch people that have clear, uh, like mental illness and you're kind of like, how, how am I supposed to be interpreting this right here? And like, is this good or bad? And it's like, like you said too, it's only because they were well off. And basically this whole movie is like, it exists because they were related to Jackie Onassis so it's yeah. and like she bailed her out at one bailed them out at one point. Right. So if, if that didn't happen, it's like what you're saying. They probably would have just died. Yeah. Well, and, and could, like, no guess, one would have known. I, we didn't really talk about the origin, I guess. Like, so this started off was that the Onassis yeah. wanted the Maisels to make a documentary about the family. Mm -hmm. um, and they did. They shot a bunch of footage. And when they were looking over it all, they're like, this real stories, these guys like yeah. this, this is interesting. And like. From a documentary standpoint, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is what you would go with. Mm -hmm. um, but like, there's like something about like, and we'll get to it one day, like uh, with Errol Morris's documentary, Gates of Heaven, uh, his documentary oh, yeah. on yeah. Uh, like animal funeral homes, like and mm -hmm. like and that sort of stuff, or animal cemeteries and what and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like this feeling of these '70s documentaries that kind of like I don't know, they're not, they have a weird vibe to them that I don't think ages well. Um, right. but I don't know if that's like yeah. a weird production thing or just something about like, oh, we're past that. Like 60s documentaries, it, it, it snaps into place and has a right feel to it. 70s stuff has a total, like kind of a hang dog kind mm -hmm. of vibe to it. But, uh, yeah. And I don't know, like I've watched, actually this could have fit into like news at one point. So like, have you seen that trailer for that, uh, uh, Steve, Steve Carell movie that's coming out? The uh, Marwin, yeah, is that is that supposed to be about Marwin Cole? That is a that is a, f a film version of the story mm, that is in Marwin. I don't think Call. I like that. No, it fuck. I that's it's brutal. So uh, yeah. for people who don't know, so Marwin Call uh, is a documentary uh, that's actually I think quite good. I think it's like very. Oh yeah, it, it's that a, movie is yeah, really good. Yeah, it's a very good documentary. Um, yep. And now. Uh, not getting into it too much, there, there is a Steve Carell movie coming out uh, starring him as the main character of Marwin Call, the Marwin, or whatever, the event of Marwin. Uh, he's like the guy, and it's a fictional take on this. I mean, it's a based on a true story sort of version of it. And I like think it, I, I, didn't even, I don't even want to click on the trailer, but everything I've seen about it and responses is like, this is brutal. Like, no, I don't want this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it seems like a ton of people have no idea that that documentary exists. And which is too bad. And I'm like, man, cause it's like, that's a, like, to me. It's like, cause that's a depiction of like a guy who is messed up and has a whole lot of things going on with mm -hmm. him. But there's sort of like an arc to the story that yeah. I, that's like, Oh, it's uplifting and whatever you want to call it. And great gardens does not uplift. That is not its intent either. I don't think to me, like it doesn't have like a, uh, a point to it. It's just like, Oh, here's these people. Well, yeah, no, there's nothing uplifting about it. It's just like, you're no. seeing these two people that like, or downlifting. Like, it's not downlifting yeah. like a uh, salesman either. It's just kind of like, Oh, this is yeah. like watching the family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like the, yeah. real, and it's just like, yeah. and they're, but they're not trying to kill anybody. They're just arguing with one another and they're not like, you know, wearing people's faces on their face or anything like that. Yeah. You know? They're just, they're just there arguing. But I think it's like I was, or I don't know. I thought it was interesting enough to uh, watch them argue too, because like I was saying, you you get a little look into their complex relationship because you're like, okay, well, it's like, what's really what really happened here? Is it 
because of the sequences of like all these shitty guys that basically abandoned them. Like the husband and father just left and then there was like boyfriends that just left and it's like, well, that can't be it. Like they they very clearly have some sort of mental illness between the two of them. They forced like, this situation. Yeah. yeah. And and but then you see kind of like how they interact with each other and kind of build off of each other's different like squabbles and like different things that they get uh, stuck up on it's like because like with Edie she's all all about like how she could have been a star and stuff like that and she always she like keeps hammering it and hammering it and then you see how the mother's kind of like tired of it and doesn't really like it but then the mother has stuff that she doesn't like either and then Edie like there's this weird thing that they go back and forth between each other so yeah and man like just thinking about uh, like in my family, there was like, there's always the story of like this one aunt, my parents, like my mom's yeah. aunt. And she's like, Oh, it's crazy Ruby or whatever her name was. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, Oh, she was just crazy and blah, blah, blah. And talk about, Oh yeah, no, I think she might've been molested by my great grandfather, weird stuff like uh-huh. that. And it's always like, uh, I, I never met hey. any of these people. It's just like weird stuff you hear offhand. Yeah. And then you find out like later on, cause like she would tell people this happened, but then it's like, now it's like, Oh no, she had by polar like diseases yeah. like that and she like lived in victoria and like she got away from all these family members and stuff like that and mm-hmm. it's like in real life it's like that's like messed up and you, no one wants to talk about it and it's like people just oh they're crazy and uh this so and so happened but that's just life and so with the documentary about this stuff uh i mean there's probably elements to that too because mm-hmm. uh like man uh, women have a hard time of life uh, is what I'll say. Yep. And it's just in, in this era that wouldn't have been even talked about, but there's probably mm-hmm. some element of that there in these rich families where people would never even think about like, Oh, Hey, yep. this, that was a bad thing that happened to me, but I'm just going to deal with it. And now we're amusing crazy cat people in documentaries. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, no uh, but speaking, speaking of like of which, ba- bad, yeah. bad, uh, f- based on true events t- films. Yeah. So there's a 2009 HBO movie called gray gardens. It stars Drew Barrymore as Edie and Jessica Lane as a uh, big Edith. Uh, so you got two hot shots here. Uh, this is a somewhat retelling, somewhat look into the like the previous lives of uh, these ladies. Um, the guy who made this, like he just did a bunch of like romance movies. Uh, and this is like just some it was an HBO show that just showed one day. Uh, this thing sucks a lot. I really hated it uh, <laughs> because um, because like a. I I actually enjoyed Grey Gardens quite a bit. And we watched that. And immediately after we were done, we popped on this uh, retelling of Grey Gardens, which I think made all of the bad things about it just like just they were glaring and you couldn't help but notice it, especially for like lines of dialogue. So uh, this thing is super uh, or it's very superficial. Um, It's. The guy who wrote this, I think, watched Grey Gardens and just wrote down like lines and dialogue from uh, research. Yeah. Yeah. He just wrote (laughs) down stuff. And then he was like, all right, we're going to use this line somewhere in this movie. Uh, Like there's stuff and it's really it's targeted and it's heavy handed. And there's like verbatim quotes that are taken out and they're just thrown in. And I don't know if it's supposed to be like ironic or whimsical because eventually those things do Uh, come true in the documentary so just for an example there are a few things that they talk about a lot in the documentary like uh, there's a time where Edie gets really mad at her mom and she's like oh she is such a staunch woman she's like she's the most staunch woman that I know and it's like a little scene it's like a two minute scene of her kind of venting about her mom so naturally in the 2009 Grey Gardens uh I think about six times Drew Barrymore is like, oh, I'm so staunch. I love being a staunch woman. Hey, Ma, you're so staunch. And you're just like, that's weird. Uh, But then there's also scenes like, and it's it's like one scene from the documentary where uh, the mom will be like, oh, yeah. She's like, I can have my cake and eat it too. Like, I did that. I had the best life. Uh, So there are a series of scenes in the movie that are like, you can't have your cake and eat it too, Edie. And it's like, I can have my cake and eat it too. And like, they just, it's it's stuff like that. And then there's even worse ones that are like, they just drop them on you and you're like, come on. Like, so Edie loses her hair in real life. 
So throughout the entire fucking movie of this thing, it's like, it's like, I hope you don't lose your hair. And it's like, oh, you have the most beautiful hair. And it's like, don't stress. You know, stress makes uh, your hair fall out. And it's just like, come on, you guys. Like, it's so, uh, like, I don't know any other way to describe it. It's so heavy handed and like superficial. It's just like, so some guy watched the documentary and just wrote down stuff that he heard. And he's like, Oh, I can write a screenplay about this. <laughs> um, and I think it's kind of unfortunate too, because I think if you like the documentary, you do kind of want to see more about these people's lives. And they show you a little bit about before they were just kind of living in this garbage pit. Um, and you see it a little bit and that's okay. Uh, but one of the other things this thing does that's really bad and annoying is they do reenactments of the documentary team they're filming. <laughs> and uh, they do two things. They do... You know, ex- my, my mental image is that, like, and they're cast... Uh, and it's they like, cast uh, the Maisels, and, like, so you who, see that... Who, inter- who, who, who are the actors that play the Maisels? I'm curious. Because uh, I'm always like, is one of them Mark Ruffalo? Because he seems to be, like, the type of guy they just no. cast to play him, just because that's, what he, that's, that's his guy. role in life now. There's this guy that uh, one of them I didn't really remember, but there was this guy that's like I see that fucking guy everywhere. Yeah. One guy was named Ari Gross. Uh, this guy's in tons of stuff. He was in like Minority Report, and he's a big TV actor. I and, think. And, Not and big, one but... of the uh, actors that play the McPoyles. That's usually how it goes. Yeah. Mark Ruffalo oh, well, and one of them. Like uh, so the other guy is Louis Ferreira, which you won't know him by name, but if you see this guy, you'll know exactly who he is. He was in like uh, Breaking Bad, and he was in he's in like a series oh, of the, TV the, shows. The old guy. He's not like old. Oh, okay. um, he's not in like a ton of Breaking Bad. He's in like I don't know, maybe like six, seven episodes or something like that. But I don't. E- I can't even tell you what else he's in. Uh, it's beside the point, anyway. Yeah, it's just when you see him, you know exactly who he is. Uh, so yeah, so you see them as the document, like making the documentary, and you're like, Ugh. and then they do two things here. They do exact reenactments of what was in the documentary, sure. but they try to recreate the quality of the footage. So it's like digitally, they, yeah, digitally, it's like grainy distress, and like it will like warble and like wave and stuff like that. Just like in the film, like just like in the, but film. it doesn't happen at all. But it's like manufact, yeah, it's like this manufactured thing to make it look old. And you're like, why are they doing that? Uh, and then the other thing that really fucking annoyed me was uh, they all show a scene that was in the documentary. And even down to like the movements of like where, how uh, they're walking through the room. But they changed the dialogue to a different scene that was in the documentary. Uh, and it was really noticeable. Like, so there's a scene where. Um, in the documentary where Edie comes out on the porch and she's like, you know, I think my time at great gardens is uh, limited. And <laughs> she goes on this thing about like how she won't be there anymore. Uh, and in this, uh, it's a scene of her at the beach and she's giving the same monologue. And it's like, why did you change it? So it, like, why, why do you have both of them where you have the exact reenactments? And then this weird, like, weird thing where you're using the dialogue but you're it's in the wrong context like you're changing where it comes up i don't get it like why why what are you doing i i don't know man i i guess people if it was all one way or the other they'd be like oh why don't you just watch the documentary or like i don't know this thing this thing sucks yeah if you like great gardens the documentary just leave it at that just leave it. That's it. Leave the memories alone. Yeah. There's nothing else out there for you. Well. Yeah. What? Th- thanks for thanks for taking the bullet on that one. Uh, I I tried. Yeah. Uh, but hey RJ. Yeah. Who who hates these documentaries? Probably a few people. As far as salesman goes, Zach Morris, half mm. a star. The only thing worse than being pitched to by scummy salesmen watching it over and over uh that's pretty uh pretty hot talk for some guy who has split in his favorite movies oh shit uh-huh yeah that's right split oh, fuck him. split more like shit <laughs> <laughs> take that in my shaman and zach uh yeah bob gave this movie salesman one star 
Mm. And he writes lengthily. Salesman is a documentary about four guys who are trying to sell Bibles to lower-income families in New England and Florida. There's also a scene from a sales meeting in Chicago. The documentary focuses on the Badger, a guy who's struggling to make a sale. I drifted back and forth through four phases while watching. One phase was curiosity, watching these people from a different era and soaking in their interactions as well as the climate. The second phase was boredom. You can only listen to them complain about dips and quads or recite the same lyric from If I Were a Rich Man for So Long. Mm -hmm. The the third phase was humor, laughing at things not meant as funny. Uh, A Bible like that will build up a heritage in the home. Well, I, for one, will triple my production for the year of 67. And the fourth phase was pain at the awkward conversations between would-be customers and these salesmen. I know we're supposed to feel for them, but I don't sympathize with or romanticize sales, let alone cold calling, especially when it starts feeling like an early precursor to multi-level marketing. Worst Mm. job I ever had was telemarketing, and I only worked in it for a few days. What a world. If I were to criticize this on its merits as art or on its cultural value, I'd likely give it a higher score, but as a movie fan, watching for enjoyment, I would not call this worth the time. I watch it because I'm looking forward to seeing it spoofed by Seth Meyers in Documentary Now. <laughs> hmm. You know, I'm actually kind of on board with uh, with this guy's review here of uh, Salesman. But would you say um, that it's a one-star movie? No, I, would, I think that's not fair. But yeah. uh, this guy's kind of all over the place. Uh, he's got a five-star pick, uh, like a Jarrett pick, Happiness. Yeah. And he's got a five-star RJ pick in uh, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. What? So, oh, uh, boy. dude's all over the place. Wow. Dude's all over the place. Uh, and as far as uh, old Grey Gardens go, uh, Shaw Wajing, half mm-hmm. a star. The first 30 minutes are interesting, but by the end, it's just two regretful old ladies bickering. They're not wrong. Words right out of my mouth. Uh, Yeah, um, they like Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Could you have guessed? Don't don't we all? Yeah. Uh, Neo Anderson. That's some uh, some Matrix references there for you. You want to guess what their number one favorite film is? The Matrix. Yes, it is. Half a star. This is the shittest film I've ever seen in my life. Shit ass documentary. Literally <laughs> wanted to die watching this. If this has a fucking 3.9, anything is possible. Only gets a 0.5 for somehow managing to get even one star from fucking esoteric, shitty, edgy critics. This is mm-hmm. shit. Don't watch it. Seriously, save yourself. Emoji movie is better. I'm not kidding. And yes, I appreciate good film. This is not good. Oh. Stop trying to make it good. I tried so hard to understand and enjoy, but you can't. It's impossible. But this movie making this score isn't so. Fuck. She also sounds like JFK. Um, this person says they appreciate good film, hey? Such as? Such as The King's Speech, five stars. Guardians of the Galaxy 2, five stars. Uh, King Arthur... Uh, Legend of the Sword, one of my favorite movies. Five stars. Uh, the Pursuit of Happiness, Spider-Man Homecoming, Get Smart? What? Five star, five star, five star. Nobody thinks those are. that's a five star movie. Yeah, this person's a liar. <laughs> uh, they have Lawrence of Arabia in their favorite films, which I, f- I feel like is a come on. Like they're, they're not really liking that movie. Lindsay Wilson, one star. Thanks, I hate it. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty good. I liked. Uh, oh, I liked that other guy when he called it shit ass. I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I do like that. It's not the shittiest film I've ever seen. It's the shittest. The shittest shit ass. Uh, what, what, uh, what, is, what is Lindsay uh, doing? Some pretty good, actually. Uh, this lady's on the level. Or it could be a uh, man. She, well, it could be. I well, in the picture, it looks like a lady, but okay. I mean, we can't make assumptions here. This is a quality podcast. That's right. Uh, in their favorite movies, we got Jaws. There you go. Something called 36 Hours with James Garner. Huh. Cape Fear with Gregory Peck. Whoa. And The Great Escape yeah, with your buddy Steve McQueen. Gross. That movie's not good. Yeah, they got good movies in here, though. It's like uh, your your favorite movie, West Side Story, and uh, my favorite movie, Monsters, Inc. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, this lady or uh, non-gender, um, non gender non binary whatever however they identify they ha- they like some good movies outstanding 
Yep. Well, there, there's the, well, there's your hate this week. Um, yeah, I I like that salesman. Uh, Great Gardens um, is everything I kind of thought it was going to be. Um, it's funny we uh we flipped on this one. We flipped on it, and you didn't. You, and you like the second movie more than the first this time, which never ever happens. So you you guys remember this. This is the one time it happened. Yeah. Well, I think that's that, RJ. We did it. We gave them yeah. what they want. Who? Them. Who who is this them? Our patrons. Oh. Or we don't listeners. Have, we don't have any patrons. <laughs> well, we got some. We got like uh, I don't know. After the break, I'm going to sell RJ a Bible. A good one? The best. It'll be blank, and you can use it to burn to keep yourself 